Welcome back to Nuclear Proliferation Explained. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is problems with preventive war. In the last lecture, we saw how states might want to launch military interventions into opponents that are developing nuclear weapons to stop those countries from acquiring a bomb. This lecture is staying on that same topic, but now explaining why preventive war is not a silver bullet. There are lots of issues that arise with taking preventive action, and as a consequence, states can't always leverage the threat of preventive war to convince opponents not to develop nuclear weapons. In particular, I'm going to highlight four issues. Fighting wars against friends or neutral opponents, the location of a country's nuclear facilities, intelligence about those facilities, and the threat of retaliation. Let's start off with friends and neutral opponents. Think about how the United States had to approach Japan's exploration of nuclear weapons. At this time, the United States and Japan are close allies, and they have common enemies in the Soviet Union and China. If the United States were to intervene militarily and destroy any facilities that Japan could use to develop a nuclear weapon, that would completely ruin that alliance relationship. Weighing the relative costs and benefits, it's clear that the United States had no interest in fighting a preventive war against Japan. The benefit would be one fewer country to develop nuclear weapons. The cost would be an ally. So I ask you, what would you rather have? An ally with nuclear weapons or no ally at all? Well, clearly an ally with nuclear weapons is the better outcome. So if you're the United States and you want to convince Japan not to develop nuclear weapons, Threatening a preventive war is not going to be an effective way of doing that. A similar problem arises with more neutral countries. During the Cold War, it's alleged that the Soviet Union approached the United States about doing a joint operation to destroy a South African nuclear facility. The United States declined. From the United States' perspective, South Africa was not a close friend, and there were lots of problems that the United States had with the racist policies that the apartheid regime was implementing within South Africa. Nevertheless, the United States did not want to turn a neutral relationship with South Africa into an openly antagonistic one, and launching a preventive war on South Africa would be a good way of doing that. So the United States passed. A couple decades earlier, we saw basically the same sort of thing, but in reverse. The United States asked the Soviet Union whether it would be interested in launching some sort of intervention against China. The Soviet Union declined. This was occurring during the Sino-Soviet split, so it wasn't like relations between the Soviet Union and China were particularly happy at this point. However, the Soviet Union did not want to have the relationship spiral out of control, and fighting a preventive war against China would be a good way of having that happen. As a consequence, the Soviet Union opted against preventive action. Next up is location. You might recall that this is the former site of Osirak, that Iraqi reactor that was being constructed in the late 1970s and early 1980s. You can't see it anymore on the map because it was destroyed. Part of the reason why Iran and Israel both had success in bombing runs against this reactor is because it was basically just sitting out in the open desert. It was an easy target for a plane. States have learned from the Iraqi experience. What you see here, or perhaps what you more accurately do not see here, is Iran's Fordow nuclear facility. The white building, basically the only thing that's visible, is just a support unit. The actual facility is buried deep underneath the mountain and you can kind of make out a few tunnel entrances to it. If Israel were to engage in the same sort of preventive action it took against Iraq, it would not be effective. The best Israel could hope for here is to bomb the entrances. It would not actually destroy what's inside of the facility, though. If Israel wanted to actually destroy the facility, it would have to put boots on the ground. And as soon as you're putting boots on the ground, the likelihood of higher casualties and greater costs in general is going to skyrocket. The Soviet Union had a different solution to this problem. Every pin on this map represents an Atomgrad. These are one of the closed cities that the Soviet Union had as a part of its nuclear program. It's the equivalent of Hanford or Los Alamos or Oak Ridge in the United States. 
you will notice that every single one of these is deep in the heart of Soviet territory. That's by design. If the United States wanted to engage in some sort of preventive action, it would have to fly through large chunks of Russia to be able to hit these sorts of targets. That makes it very difficult to do. They're protected. It's harder to engage in preventive war against these. This isn't the only problem that the United States encountered in a hypothetical preventive war against the Soviet Union. And this transitions us to our next topic, intelligence. At the time it would have been appropriate to fight a preventive war against the Soviet Union, the U.S. was undergoing a transition in its intelligence capacity, shifting away from the OSS that was front and center during World War II and moving on to the CIA. As a consequence, the United States had no idea what was going on. We've seen this manifest itself before, with the Soviet Union penetrating spies deep into the U.S. nuclear program. But it went beyond that. At the end of World War II, the U.S. had no intelligence assets on the ground within the Soviet Union, and it was slow to make up for that. As a consequence, the U.S. had no idea where these Atomgrads were. So even if the United States figured out the logistics on how to strike deep into the Soviet Union, it didn't actually know where to go. Last up is retaliation, and North Korea provides a good illustration for the issues here. When North Korea was making a push for nuclear weapons in the 1990s, Bill Clinton consulted some of his generals about fighting a preventive war against North Korea. The generals responded by pointing out a major problem. This is a satellite photo of the Korean peninsula. The arrow is pointing at a light line that goes across the peninsula, which is the demilitarized zone. Just south of it, we see Seoul and its surrounding regions. This is both the population center of South Korea as well as the economic hub. And just north of that, in North Korea, is a whole bunch of North Korean artillery. As a result, the generals responded that yes, it would be possible to engage in preventive action against North Korea, and it would only take six months. But it would cost one trillion dollars, and it would leave one million people dead. Clinton responded that no one had told him that before, and after that conversation, he never really brought it up again. Aside from the artillery problem, the United States also has to think about alliance politics. China has a relationship with North Korea and has a historical concern about a Western country sharing a land border with it. If the United States were to intervene in North Korea, it's fully possible that China would counter intervene to support the North Korean regime. And this would only add to the amount of costs and damage and death as a consequence of trying to initiate a preventive action. Forgetting about death for a moment, there are also great economic concerns with preventive war. Between the Persian Gulf and the Gulf of Oman, there's a narrow strip of water called the Strait of Hormuz. A concern if the United States or Israel were to engage in a preventive war against Iran is that Iran would then shut down that strait. This is a big problem for the entire world because 20% of all oil funnels through the Strait of Hormuz. And so shutting that down will create great economic havoc worldwide. Putting all of this together, the central takeaway here is that preventive war is not a universal solution to the proliferation problem. You might not want to fight a war against friends or neutral opponents, you might not have the ability to engage in the war properly, you might not know what to do to actually stop the program, and you might be worried about the retaliation that would occur if you were to try. All of these things together mean that you need other tools if you are a non-proliferation advocate to convince states not to develop nuclear weapons. And that will be a topic for another time. Hope you enjoyed this, and hope to see you next time. Take care.